Hey folks, welcome to History of Hackers Part 2. In this video, we'll discuss some key events that contributed to the rise of hacking in mainstream culture, starting with the first big internet attack. On November 2nd, 1988, the internet experienced its first major attack by the way of the Morris Worm. The Defense Department, universities, and research centers are still recovering tonight from a computer virus that brought a nationwide network to a standstill. The Morris Worm was a rogue computer program that caused vital military and university functions to slow to a halt by replicating from system to system and depleting resources that those computers needed to operate. And as it replicates the code, the so-called virus eats up large amounts of memory. It wipes out stored data or cripples the hardware. It targeted computers using a specific version of the Unix operating system, which meant it affected about 6,000 of the roughly 60,000 or so computers connected to the internet at the time. The Morris Worm affected many important institutions, including Ivy League universities, U.S. national laboratories, even NASA. It arrived at MIT in the middle of the night. The students were safe. Their computers weren't. It forced a lot of these institutions to wipe their systems or even disconnect from the network completely. Hello, IT. Have you tried turning it off and on again? Another consequence of the Morris Worm was the financial damage, which was estimated to be in the millions even back then. In the aftermath, you had a lot of intelligent, pissed off people, and they wanted to know who done it. Ben, Richard must be found. He must be found and brought here for safety. As it turned out, the hacker inadvertently gave himself up. Robert Tappan Morris, a 23-year-old Cornell University graduate student, was eventually found to be the hacker that launched the worm, and that's why it's named after him. After the attack, he admitted to two friends that he did it, but he didn't anticipate the worm spiraling out of control like it had. It would enter your machine, it would do its thing, it would go to other machines. He told one friend to send an anonymous apology over the internet but the worm disrupted communication so effectively that hardly anyone got the message. His other friend made an anonymous call to the New York Times, saying it was a harmless experiment, the results of a programming error, but the friend kept talking to the reporter and accidentally referred to RTM, Robert Tappan Morris's initials. That let the cat out of the bag. Morris was a talented computer scientist, and in particular, he knew a lot about Unix. But it was uncovered that he had hacked into MIT from Cornell to try to conceal his identity when he planted the worm. That piece of information was the smoking gun that led to his arrest and eventual conviction, based on the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act that we mentioned in Part 1. The Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, or the CFAA, specifically outlawed unauthorized access to protected computers. Considering the damage, some would say Morris got off pretty easy. He received a fine, probation, and 400 hours of community service, but no jail time. It was an important moment because Robert Morris was the first person convicted under this new law. For Cornell University graduate student Robert Morris was indicted today for planting a virus that infiltrated more than 6,000 computers across the country. The Morris Worm was a classic example of the harm that Ken Thompson saw coming in Reflections on Trusting Trust, the paper we talked about in part one. And now, hackers could no longer use innocent intentions as justification. The important takeaway from this attack was that it highlighted how vulnerable computers were and how devastating a cyber attack could be. <laughs> Think about it. One worm was able to wreak havoc on all of these major institutions. As the world began to rely more heavily on technology, people started to realize how important cybersecurity was. The Department of Defense created a computer emergency response team, and developers started to build intrusion detection software. While it was true that the Morris worm inspired a new wave of hackers, it's important to understand some context. Robert Morris's dad actually worked at Bell Labs, where Unix was created. That's how he developed his knowledge of Unix and was able to launch this attack. 
he had connections. Average citizens didn't have access to the internet yet. It was primarily used within government, research, and education communities. So you had to be a part of these communities, you needed access to a computer, you needed to have knowledge of these operating systems and their components, you needed to fundamentally understand that computers could be abused. There were several obstacles to creating an attack like this. The Morris Worm was a big concern for those communities, but it didn't make hacking mainstream. The average citizen still didn't understand the impact of the Morris Worm because they didn't even know what it was. That would soon change with the introduction of the World Wide Web. The dispersion of knowledge increased as the internet became more accessible, leading to the rise of hackers and cyber attacks. The next pivotal moment in the history of hackers was the release of a book that introduced many people to the world of cybersecurity for the very first time. In 1989, an assistant systems administrator named Clifford Stoll published a book called The Cuckoo's Egg. The Cuckoo's Egg was a first-person account of his hunt for a hacker. Stoll worked at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and one day his supervisor asked him to resolve a discrepancy. There were 75 cents unaccounted for in the computer usage account. 75 cents... Come on now, even back then that was chump change. In 1986, the year when his search started, a loaf of bread was a dollar. <laughs> Sounds like his boss was just trying to keep him busy, doesn't it? I'll go ahead and make sure you get another copy of that memo. Okay? Yeah. Well, Clifford Stoll took this 75 cent discrepancy seriously. And by seriously, I mean he went overboard. Maybe he just had a little spare time, or he's just one of those people you don't want to mess with. Either way, he uncovered quite a story, and it wouldn't have happened without his persistence. What Clifford found was that the discrepancy resulted from nine seconds of computer time coming from an unauthorized user. You see, back then, computers were so expensive people were charged for the time their users spent on a communal computer system. So down the wormhole Clifford went. While his co-workers were out for the weekend, Stolt borrowed 50 terminals off of their desk. He connected those 50 terminals along with 50 teleprinters to 50 incoming phone lines at the laboratory. When the unauthorized user called in that weekend, Stoll was able to locate the phone line they were using. He called the routing service, which informed him the number originated from a call center at MITRE, a defense contractor. Yes, the same MITRE that plays a key role in cybersecurity today. But at this point, Stoll reached something of a dead end. But that didn't stop him. No, he kept going down the wormhole. He left a teleprinter hooked up to the line and recorded everything the hacker did. He kept daily logs about the hacker's activity. In fact, Stoll might have been the first person to monitor and log hacking activity like this. As he looked through the documentation, he realized the hacker was looking to access military bases in the U.S. and find out information about nuclear programs and defense strategies. I'm looking at the stuff and I'm saying, this is weird. I'm looking at some hacker breaking into my computer and stealing military information. The funny thing is, the hacker was able to access basically whatever they wanted. Most of the systems were protected by default passwords that were never changed. So what did Stoll do with this information? Exactly what you think. Come on, this is 75 cents here. Somebody's got to pay for this. I'm not. We're talking about unchecked aggression here. Stoll called up the FBI, the CIA, the NSA. He tried to get all of the big government agencies involved. And nobody cared. Let me see what I can do and I'll get back to you. There wasn't a ton of money involved. No classified information was stolen. They weren't interested. But even that didn't stop Stoll. I like to imagine he's just this nagging kid that keeps bugging them.
Eventually, some agents from those big government agencies and the routing service helped Stoll to trace the hacker to a place in West Germany. Now Stoll was cooking, the table was set. He just needed that one little finishing ingredient. That's where this gets hilarious. Stoll and his girlfriend conceive of a plan in the shower, which they dub Operation Showerhead, to bait the hacker into revealing their identity. Operation Showerhead was an amazing, elaborate hoax. Stoll created fake files, files that looked important, and put them on the laboratory computers. These files needed to be juicy enough to lure the hacker in. And what do you know? The hacker bit. Bam, 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 bam. A German phone service was able to track down the activity to a hacker named Marcus Hess. Who was this guy? Turns out Hess was a German citizen that sold military information to the KGB. I checked, everything's there. Wait a minute. <clears throat> no big deal. It's not like the USA and the Soviet Union were in a cold war or anything. Oops. I mean, I wonder how many government agents got fired over that one. Uh, what, what would you say you do here? think it's safe to assume the U.S. government probably didn't want to give away free information to one of its largest enemies. So maybe we should be worried about 75 cents after all. It sounds crazy, but in this instance, 75 cents was worth a whole lot more than face value. Stoll went really deep down a wormhole. I mean, it looks completely insane to most people, but he came out vindicated. He showed us the importance of logging and monitoring, tools that are still very vital to modern day cybersecurity. And these tools require a lot of persistence. Stoll had that in spades. Stoll exposed the US government's limited approach to authentication, something we still struggle with today, even with the introduction of multi-factor authentication. Point is, a strong password can be a useful tool to deter hackers. The cuckoo's egg also showed us that hacking can have a profound effect on national security. A lax approach to cybersecurity can leave important information free for the taking to anyone, but more importantly, to countries with malicious intentions. The history of hackers is littered with red flags, wake-up calls, and opportunities for what we like to call come-to-Jesus moments. Take the fresh breath of the spirit! The cuckoo's egg was one of those moments, and it opened the eyes of many to the field of cybersecurity. The next stop in the history of hackers happened seven years later, when hacking permeated mainstream culture on a whole other level. In 1996, an anonymous hacker shared a tutorial which not only explained how the Morris worm worked, but described how other similar vulnerabilities worked that hackers could take advantage of. The paper, written under pseudonym Aleph1 and called Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit, was published in FRAC, an electronic magazine written by and for hackers, and this was available to anyone that could access the internet. The tutorial explained a type of vulnerability called a stack buffer overflow and how to exploit them. Like I said, this is the same type of vulnerability that was used in the Morris worm attack that we were just talking about. Smashing the stack for fun and profit was really significant because it was the first high quality, public, step-by-step -step guide on how to exploit these vulnerabilities. And the real importance of that was you no longer needed connections to have access to this type of knowledge. You didn't have to be an Ivy League student. You didn't even have to pay for this information. This paper wasn't hidden behind a paywall. It was entirely free for individuals to read and possess copies of it. And Frack wasn't the only magazine like this. Available to anyone with a personal computer, the Parents Place Bulletin Board is online every evening. There were other magazines and underground bulletin boards with this type of information. Think of a site like Reddit, where you find information on just about any topic you want. It's all in one place. At this time, information wasn't centralized, and you had to know where to look. 
but these public forums started popping up more and more, and the information was spreading. The public accessibility of the internet started to wipe away all of the barriers to hacking that had previously existed. Now, any average citizen could be a hacker, not just the educated elite. And smashing the stack for fun and profit had a profound impact on that. The events we covered in this video propelled hacking into the mainstream. You didn't have to be connected anymore. You didn't need special access. Those obstacles were gone. The internet became a public resource, and you could find any of the information you needed to learn how to hack. As information started to spread, the world was beginning to see the potential impact of hacking. In part three, we'll see that play out even further, as national cybersecurity vulnerabilities are exposed and a group of white hat hackers tries to get the nation to finally take cybersecurity seriously. Thanks for watching.